ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you to please take your seats. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of their excellencies, the Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia, General the Honourable Peter Cosgrove and Lady Cosgrove, the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the President of the Senate. Please be seated. I'd like to ask Auntie Tina Brown and Uncle Adrian Brown to perform the Welcome to Country and smoking ceremony. Good morning and welcome to the beautiful lands of the Ngunnawal. I begin by acknowledging my parents, Carl and Louise Brown, and all of the Ngunnawal elders and ancestors, and my brother Adrian for his leadership in our family and for doing today's smoking ceremony or cleansing ceremony. 30 years ago, there was no involvement of the Ngunnawal in the opening of this great building. And despite this, my father and his brother, Uncle Donald Brown, were very proud that they worked on the building during its decade long construction. In fact, long before the work of Parliament House began, and as I was a little one, I joined my father and our family and other Aboriginal families who used to camp up here on Capitol Hill for ceremonies and for dance and song and storytelling. In 1988, there were many Indigenous people and supporters from around Australia protesting the bicentenary and the opening of Parliament House. Back then, even Her Majesty the Queen encountered both cheers and jeers during the opening. Today on this 30th anniversary birthday celebration, it is a different matter. Today we celebrate this anniversary together. In contrast to the reception of Her Majesty received, I, on behalf of the Ngunnawal, have been asked to conduct a traditional welcome and it is I who has the pleasure of acknowledging and welcome the Queen's representative and our very own Governor-General, Your Excellency Sir Peter Cosgrove. I also acknowledge other distinguished guests and happy 30th birthday to Parliament House. Many of you will know that Canberra is a local word meeting meeting place. Our oral stories and signs tell us that we have been meeting in this area for 25,000 years or more than 100 genera generations. What a contrast to such a modern democracy evolving on this ancient land. Our people have been able to maintain our long connection to this area because the country provided fresh air to breathe, clean water to drink, nourishing food to eat and clothing and shelter to keep us warm through our bitterly cold winters. It is on this once exacting land, as the extreme cold of the last ice age was easing, that my ancestors forged their resilience and grew their knowledge of country and handed to those of us who follow them the legacy of our ancestral beings and our creation stories and the responsibility for future of our people and country. They form pathways across this land to guide us. These pathways developed as our ancestors followed the river and creek corridors and the ridges and spurs on the hills and mountains, linking our major spiritual and gathering places. Canberra itself, is some, Canberra itself and some of its modern roads and tracks evolved from these ancient pathways. These pathways developed as our ancestors Sorry, the responsibility for the future of our people and country now rests with us, which is why I'm here conducting this Welcome to Country. I too am playing a role in forging a modern Australia based on the best our ancient and continuous culture can bring to this evolving democratic nation. So on behalf of my extended family and the elders of my people, and in recognition of all who have gone before us, I welcome you to the ancestral lands of the Ngunnawal. I welcome my Indigenous sisters and brothers and am in awe of our legacy, tens and thousands of years in the making. 
I welcome our fellow Australians and honour the mingling of the dust of the bones of my ancestors and the dust of the bones of your ancestors, for it is this which now shapes the land, uniting us all as custodians of Australia's future. Welcome to the beautiful lands of the Ngunnawal. And again, happy 30th birthday celebrations for the opening of Parliament House. I would now like to hand over to my brother Adrian, who will conduct the smoking ceremony, a very real link to the spirits and our ancestors. Uh, thank you, my beautiful sister, for that lovely speech. Um, I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about smoking ceremonies and what that means to our people um, and why this tradition started and why we keep it going. Um, so basically in the old days it was really important for our people that when we moved through country that we done the, done the smoking because as we walk through landscape we actually pick up um, energies, so energies from spirits, energies from country, trees, water. And it's important that when we move through country and to different new places that we smoke away and get rid of those spirits and welcome the spirits of the people whose lands that we're on. So um, what I'm going to do now is put some leaves on and we'll get, get the smoke going and um, I'd like to also invite um, all the delegates to come down with the children um, and embrace that smoke. It's very important that we do that. Um, I tend to wash myself a lot. It's, 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 it's like a uh, cleansing and it's very important that we do this. So I'll just get some leaves on.
Thank you, everybody. Um, it was a, a very a great privilege to be here today with my sister, my mother, Louise Brown, who's sitting over um, up there. I uh, just really um, value my elders and their ongoing, continuing contributions to Canberra, Ngunnawal country, and the people who live here today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Auntie Tina Brown and Uncle Adrian Brown. Uh, before we proceed, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the Honourable Warren Snowden, member for Lingiari, uh, the only member of parliament uh, to have served in both old and new parliament house uh, that is here today. I'd now like to invite the Speaker of the House of Representatives the Honourable Tony Smith MP to make the opening remarks. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, Auntie Tina uh, and Uncle Adrian for that uh, very warm welcome. His Excellency the Governor-General and Lady Cosgrove, parliamentary colleagues, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this ceremony marking the 30th anniversary of the opening of this Parliament House by Her Majesty the Queen on the 9th of May 1988. On that day, 30 years ago, Her Majesty described Parliament House as a confident expression of Australia's faith in parliamentary democracy. It was then and it still is now. From the opening of the first parliament in the Melbourne Exhibition Buildings, through the 26 years in the Victorian Parliament, before the opening of the Provisional Parliament House 91 years ago today, this permanent parliament was always planned. It's proven to be a wonderful meeting place for the democratic contest of ideas and ideals by elected representatives of the Australian people. An architectural icon at the heart of a national capital. It represents the ambition of our democracy that uniquely began with a vote of the people who at that time also determined there would be a national parliament in a national capital. 30 years ago, Her Majesty also said this, parliamentary democracy is a compelling idea but it is a fragile institution. It cannot be imposed and it is only too easily destroyed. It needs the positive dedication of the people as a whole and of their elected representatives to make it work. Today, we recommit ourselves to treasuring and preserving the democratic ideals this magnificent building represents. We, of course, honour the legacy of the national leaders, architects, builders and artists who have brought this Parliament House to life. And most of all, we honour the Australian people whom we serve, who own this Parliament House. I now call upon representatives of Canberra's faith communities to lead us as their predecessors did on the 9th of May 1988 in a multi-faith blessing. O oh God, we give thanks for Australia, the great south land of the Holy Spirit. Bless our people here. Bless the first Australians and those who have traversed the seas to build our wonderful nation. Grant eternal rest and resurrection to those men and women who have given their lives for our freedom and our peace. Inspire our citizens with respect for every human life. May the common good prevail over individual preference. Arouse within us the spirit of initiative and participation, 
imbue within us the spirit of solidarity. In our time, may our public and political figures be light to the world and salt to the earth. For unless the Lord builds the house, <clears throat> those who build it will labour in vain. Amen. O Lord our God, bestow your grace upon all those who exercise authority in this house, so that they may perform their duties faithfully and in accordance with the oaths that they have taken. Speak good things into the hearts of the leaders, so that all that they do may be for the good of your people, bring success to all their efforts, in order that all their undertakings may be for the common good and for the benefit of our nation. Amen. Ima Adonai lo yiv nevayeth shau almalo vonovo. Ima Adonai lo yishmor shir ir shau shakad shomer. If the Lord does not build the house, they that build it labor in vain. If the Lord does not guard the city, the watchman awakens in vain. O oh God, we ask that you bless this house and this city, that wise and just governess may eternally guide the people of this land. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, good day and Islamic greetings of the peace. It is my sincere pleasure to be able to speak among us to you today. As a community, we, the Muslims, favor the highly regard the universal principles of equality, kindness, and tolerance. Our Prophet, peace be upon him, said, the merciful are shown mercy by the all-merciful. Show mercy to those on earth, and God will show mercy to you. If anyone harms others, Allah will harm him. And if anyone shows hostility to others, Allah will show hostility to him. God says in the Holy Quran, chapter 4, 9, verse 1, 3, O mankind, we created you and made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most honored of you in the sight of God is he who is the most righteous of you. In the spirit of this verse, I hope and pray that we may continue to understand one another and act justly as God loves those who are just. Thank you very much. Gracious and loving God, ruler of the nations, we pray for the parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia, for this building, for the members, for senators and officers who work in this place and for all who visit. May this building inspire us as a nation to mutual service of one another and in our commitment to justice and good government. We give thanks for the last 30 years of presence and service in this place and for the way this building enables the work and lives of those who come here. Direct the work of this parliament, influence the decisions made here, be powerfully present with all who work in this place so that all may be done to the advancement of your glory and for the safety and welfare of this nation. So enable the work of this building and the parliament which meets here, that peace, happiness, truth and justice may be proclaimed and established among all your people. May the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest on this place and all who work here. Amen. I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people on whose land Parliament House sits and on a past, present and future elders. May we always have a heart to hear the wisdom of our first peoples who have cultivated and respected this land for more than 60,000 years. I was blessed to work in this grand building of great beauty and was struck by the glorious aesthetics of the often small details of its design. 
I pay tribute to all who brought it to fruition, including the Honourable Malcolm Fraser for his determined vision and to those who maintain it. I loved this building and it loved me back. It still does. Love is all powerful, greater than fear, the lust for power and contention. Jesus commands us to love God and our neighbours as ourselves. Love is above all. It makes straight the path and fosters unity, which this nation once knew and now craves. Living God, please nurture and encourage all who work here to live with love and kindness and to respect one another in the face of diversity and difference. May Australia be known for its unity, kindness and compassion, particularly for the stranger in the land. Loving God, please bless all who serve in this house and through them, the nation, now and forever. Amen. We're privileged this morning to be joined by the children of the ACT Primary Concert Choir to sing the National Anthem. Could you please be upstanding for the National Anthem? I now invite the President of the Senate, Senator the Honourable Scott Ryan, to make a brief address. Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of the Parliament, and particularly the Senate and Senators, welcome to this celebration. A very special welcome to His Excellency the Governor-General, my colleague the Speaker, all my colleagues, and most importantly, our fellow citizens. First, my congratulations to the ACT Primary Concert Choir for that fantastic rendition of our national anthem. I can say I wasn't much older than you when I watched the opening of this building. It's an incredible honour to serve in it and I know I speak on behalf of all my parliamentary colleagues that one of the things that constantly inspires us is our children. Second, my thanks to the representatives of many of our faiths and their blessings today. Like this building and the democracy it represents, you remind us that even as individuals, we are part of something bigger than ourselves. I'd like to echo the speaker's guests to, to welcome to guests here today, the people we serve in this place. It was 117 years ago today that our national parliament first met in my hometown of Melbourne. 
in what was before and since the Victorian Parliament, built by the rush of gold that brought people from around the world to our shores. Just as it is today, it was a parliament elected by the people under a constitution they themselves had written and voted for by referendum. Something we should never take for granted. It was a lot less common then than it is now. Today, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of this building, built as the permanent home of our democracy, albeit a few decades later than originally intended. The construction of this building also drew thousands of people from across our country and around the world to join us and build our democracy along with their lives and families, continuing the great tradition of this country as a magnet for hope. Placed here at the axis of this national city down to the Australian War Memorial, Parliament House directly connects our democracy to the sacrifices of hundreds of thousands of men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice to guarantee the freedoms and opportunities we hold dear, both for ourselves and our fellow man around the world. I know I speak on behalf of all my parliamentary colleagues in saying it is a great honour to be here today to celebrate not just this building, but what it represents, Australia's democracy, one of the world's oldest and most successful, that not only has a great deal to be proud of, but a bright future as a beacon of opportunity and freedom. Could I please now ask you to join me in welcoming His Excellency, the Governor-General, the Honourable Sir Peter Cosgrove, Governor-General of Australia. Honourable presiding officers, uh, members of the Senate, members of Parliament, Mr Rob Stefanik, the Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services and Staff, Auntie Tina and Uncle Adrian Brown, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to elders from other communities who may be with us today. We look down at this marvellous vista, this iconic avenue from New Parliament through Old Parliament along Anzac Avenue to the Woman World. We look beyond, behind it to the brooding mountain we call Mount Ainsley, but which is, rests on ground here that was trodden for millennia only by the Indigenous First Australians. Distinguished guests, including the Reverend Gentleman and Lady who helped us with prayers a moment or two ago, ladies and gentlemen, Good morning and welcome as we celebrate this 30th anniversary of the official opening of Parliament House. At the time, this building was known as the New Parliament House. It was then a bold statement about architecture, about Walter Burley Griffin's vision for Canberra, about Australia, our democracy and aspirations. This was a new building for a new time, a place to accommodate our growing number of parliamentarians, where our democratic traditions and processes could continue and thrive, where our leaders could meet and debate the issues of the day, where the Australian people could literally and symbolically oversee the processes of democracy and government. 30 years on with this grand forecourt and the vista it offers, acknowledging our indigenous past, and beyond and behind me, the great hall and the chambers with our national flag towering above us. This is a building for a nation, a building for all Australians. It is of us and for us, and today we celebrate it. We admire what it is, its beauty and its craftsmanship. We respect all it represents. And we bestow our faith upon those who come and work here on our behalf, on our nation's behalf. It was Her Majesty the Queen who officiated at the opening 30 years ago. And Her Majesty has conveyed her best wishes for today and for all the events marking this milestone. And as with any good anniversary, we have a cake. And as my understanding, it is my duty with others to perform the cutting. So welcome to you all as we celebrate this iconic building and the robust democracy it houses to Australia's Parliament House. Happy 30th birthday.
assisting with the cutting uh, of the cake. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and students who have travelled from near and far to be with us here today, I'd like to thank you for joining us to celebrate this special milestone. To our distinguished guests, their excellencies, the Governor General and Lady Cosgrove, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honourable Tony Smith, the President of the Senate, Senator the Honourable Scott Ryan, and current and past parliamentarians and colleagues from parliamentary departments. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us here today. It's great to see so many parliamentarians, uh, particularly as this day coincides with the busiest sitting week of the parliamentary calendar. I'd also like to thank Auntie Tina and Uncle Adrian for their generous welcome to country and representatives of the faith groups for their contribution to today's ceremony. A moving reminder of the official opening ceremony 30 years ago. I'm sure you'll agree that the ACT Primary Concert Choir's rendition of our national anthem was marvellous. Thank you to the talented choristers and their conductor, Mrs Catherine Finlayson. Please put your hands together once more for these very talented young people. In closing, I'd like to take the opportunity to remind you that our 30th anniversary celebrations will continue throughout the year. I encourage you to keep an eye on the Parliament House website for information on all our ongoing program of events and exhibitions. I look forward to seeing many of you back here on the 6th of October in particular for our open day, which I'm sure will be the largest event of our 30th anniversary program. The choir will now perform a selection of songs while you enjoy your birthday cake. Thank you and good morning.
Good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I pay my respects to them and their elders past and present, and I also pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. For those I haven't met, my name is Rob Stefanik and I'm the Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services. Uh, I am proud and privileged to be the custodian of this building. I'd like to welcome the many special guests here today. Um, I'll only mention a few of them. Uh, former President of the Senate, the Honourable Michael Bean, AM. Former Speakers of the House of Representatives, the Honourable Neil Andrew, AO, and the Honourable Bronwyn Bishop. His Excellency, Mr. Stefano Gatti, Italian Ambassador to Australia. Mr. Rick Thorpe, AM, architect and founding partner of Mitchell, Jurgler and Thorpe. Ms. Paola Jurgler, daughter of the architect of Australian Parliament House, Mr. Romaldo Jurgler, AO. And Mr. Warren Snowden, MP, member for Lingiari, the only current parliamentarian to have served in both old and new Parliament House. I uh, also wish to acknowledge uh, current and former parliamentarians that are also here, uh, distinguished guests, uh, current and former colleagues of the parliamentary departments, and ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to extend my thanks to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, the Honourable Tony Smith MP, for taking the time to be with us today um, for what is uh, ahead of one of the busiest sitting weeks uh, of the parliamentary calendar. Uh, he and Barry Cassidy have only just managed to join us after their flight, flight from Melbourne uh, was delayed, so um, we're glad they could make it, make it here in time. Uh, I also convey apologies from the Honourable Scott Ryan, the President of the Senate, uh, who is unfortunately unable to be with us today due to a long-standing uh, commitment. Uh, however, he sends his best wishes uh, to everybody here today. It is. Uh, great to have everyone here this morning for the latest event in a year-long program celebrating the 30th anniversary of Parliament House. Before I hand over to Mr Speaker uh, to introduce our panel discussion, can I please ask everyone to ensure that your mobile phones are either switched off or turned on to silent? In the very likely, unlikely event of an emergency, follow the directions uh, of our parliamentary security staff uh, alternatively, just run behind me. <laughs> We're fortunate to have an Auslan interpreter here today, uh, as you can see, and the event is also being recorded and live streamed through our Palview site, which is accessible at www.palview.aph.gov.au. Uh, now, Mr Speaker, can I please invite you to come up and make a few introductory remarks and introduce the panel. Thank you so much, Rob, uh, to invited guests. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming along here today on this Saturday to um, help us celebrate the 30 years since the official opening of this magnificent building. I first came to work here at Parliament House in the early 1990s, and I still recall feeling overwhelmed as I approached the building uh, and came inside to see just what a grand building it was. Even today I'm reminded of the enormous effort that went into creating a permanent home for our parliament and a building that represents all Australians. The parliament has assembled in only four locations since Federation. At the Royal Exhibition Building for the first sitting, in the Victorian Parliament for 26 years until 1927, the Provisional Parliament House for 27 years until the opening of this magnificent building and of course uh, a visit back in 2001 to the Exhibition Building for the Centenary of Federation. This Wednesday the 9th of May uh, marks 30 years to the day from the opening of this building by Her Majesty the Queen. In the speech given by the Queen to mark the occasion 30 years ago, Her Majesty said this, parliamentary 
democracy is a compelling ideal, but it is a fragile institution. It cannot be imposed and it is too easily destroyed. It needs the positive dedication of the people as a whole and their representatives to make it work. And I think you'd all agree those words ring true today as they did 30 years ago. Particularly pertinent given that Australians in 1901 were the first peoples anywhere in the world to vote to create a democratic nation. Democracy still derives its vitality from the belief that we are all in it together, that it's a vast cooperative effort in which we are all partners and as partners uh, must play our part, whether as representatives or as citizens engaged with the parliamentary and political processes. Of course, Parliament House is central to this. It represents the coming together of the nation in the great cause of democracy. It's a meeting place for the nation, a focus for discussion of public affairs and the big issues of the day. It is at once a great architectural and artistic achievement and a symbol of the cherished system of representative government that we hold in trust for generations of Australians to come. Of course, the design and the construction of Parliament House was a remarkable achievement. Countless people from all over Australia and abroad plied their trade on the construction project. Parliament House was created by some of this country's best architects, designers, builders and artists. It is in every sense a house of the people, an enduring symbol of the democratic principles our nation's been built upon, as well as a reflection of our history and our culture. Today we meet in one of the most talked about buildings in our nation. You'd be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't have an opinion on Parliament House, both the building itself and of course the political processes it plays host to. Today, our guest panellists have different connections and experiences with the building, but I've got no doubt they share a diverse range of opinions and they'll do that with us as we reflect on the 30 years of Parliament House. And I'd like you to join with me in welcoming formally our panel. Uh, the Honourable Dr Kay Patterson. Kay's distinguished career in the Federal Parliament in the Australian Senate uh, spanned from 1987 until 2008. She held cabinet positions in health and social security. Her commitment to addressing social issues has continued and in her current role, she is Age Discrimination Commissioner. Welcome, Kay. <laughs> Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans enjoyed a 21-year career here in the Federal Parliament, serving as a Cabinet Minister in both the Hawke and Keating governments, serving as a Senator and then a member of the House of Representatives. Uh, Gareth bears some responsibility for the building we're meeting today having been a member of the panel that chose the winning design for new Parliament House. Welcome, welcome back, Gareth. Great to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Representing the arts community, I'm very pleased to welcome singer, writer, artistic director, Robin Archer. As I can tell so many of you know, Robin's impressive career has included stints as the Artistic Director of the Adelaide and Melbourne International Arts Festivals. Many of you here in Canberra will recall her work directing the Centenary of Canberra program in 2013. Robin is the current Chair of the Master of Fine Arts in Cultural Leadership at the country's leading performing arts training institute, NIDA. Also joining us on our panel today is David Chandler, who has over 40 years uh, ex construction industry experience in Australia and the Asia Pacific. He's been at the helm of many projects during his career, including the role of construction director for the construction of Parliament House. Welcome, David. <laughs> and rounding out our panel, we have one of Australia's most respected and experienced political journalists. 
With over 40 years' experience in the parliamentary press gallery, Michelle Grattan became the first female editor of a daily newspaper when she was appointed editor of the Canberra Times in 1993. Michelle's also held positions with The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald, The Australian Financial Review and is currently the chief political correspondent of The Conversation. Welcome, Michelle. And I'd like to welcome our panel moderator for today, one of the country's most experienced journalists and host of the ABC's Insiders program, Barry Cassidy. Thank you. Barry brings a great deal of personal experience to today's discussion, having experienced the transition from the old to new Parliament House during his time as a press secretary and a senior media advisor, as a journalist, then a press secretary and senior media advisor to former Prime Minister Bob Hawke. Barry, I'd like to invite you to get the conversation underway. And again, thanks to all our panellists for giving their time today to give us their reflections. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Let's talk about Parliament House, new Parliament House 30 years on. Um, I, I arrived here in 1979. One of the very first stories I covered was the announcement of the winning design. Um, I've, I've been accused of uh, bias on occasions through the years, and that's one I will plead guilty to. I was biased because I loved it from the start, and I think that was reflected uh, in the way that I, uh, that I reported the announcement. It had to be a national symbol, but they didn't want it to be a monument on a hill. And the idea that it would nestle into the hill and rise out of the landscape, that, that it was accessible without, uh, without being imposing, I think was the absolute key to it, and that's what struck me at the time. Um, Gareth Evans was uh, one of the judges from the Senate. Uh, an old friend of mine, Barry Simon, um, was uh, represented the House of Representatives um, on that panel. 329 original entries, that was, uh, there was a short list of 10 and eventually five were invited uh, uh, to submit, uh, to make submissions. So Gareth, uh, we'll start with you because that's where it started. Um, give us a sense of, of that experience as you went through the, the entries. And one of the most fabulous things of all was just finding myself uh, on that panel in the first place because I'd only been in the parliament less than a couple of years. And the only reason I got onto the, the panel um, was the P Labor caucus was full of terrible old shellbacks who thought this was a pufterish sort of thing to be wanting to be engaged in, which I was perfectly welcome to engage in if I put my hand up. So I found myself in this fabulous process with uh, I M Pay, the international superstar architect, uh, John Andrews, the enfant terrible of uh, Australia in architecture, John Overall, very distinguished panel. And we had this task, first of all, of winnowing down to 10 finalists, 329 original entrants, as you said, which was a hell of a task in itself, and then choosing a winner a few months later from the finally worked up designs. I have to say from the outset that um, the winning design of and Rick Thorpe, one of the winning architects uh, with Aldo Jurgler is, is here among us, really sort of stood out from the beginning. It was, was quite extraordinary. It, it wasn't fully worked up, it wasn't fully realised in the original submission, but it sure as hell was when it came to the, uh, the second round. And even though there were a lot of distinguished competitors in the field, including Harry Seidler, who some of you will have seen uh, at his design getting a run in the Financial Review this morning, even though there were a lot of competitors, this is the one that really stuck out because it, it married, as you just said, Barry, uh, the idea of a big monumental building that Australians could be you know, very proud of, but at the same time it had to have a, a sort of a, a democratic character about it. it. It had to not be big and glowering and, and inaccessible. And I remember writing the report on the winning design. I was the one that actually penned those words, I think, about the, the inherently democratic character of the building with these big sweeping grass lawns you know, going over the top. Um, that it was you know, far from being forbidding and inaccessible. This was the kind of building that you know, people could walk over and children could clamber on and play on. And uh, you know, so there was that about it, combined, of course, with the monumentality of the facade and the, uh, the flagpole at the top, which gave it a coherence, which a lot of the other designs, although they were very elegant or very interesting in their own ways, um, simply lacked. One of the things we, we talked about on the design panel was the necessity for the, the image of Parliament House somehow being able to be captured on a postage stamp. 
Um, and you know, it's just it had to have a, a simplicity enough about it, which was capable of capturing the imagination and being. A, and so the, the flagpole ended up sort of playing essentially that role, the flagpole and the facade. But overall, it was was probably one of the most fascinating experiences I've ever had in my life, and I'm very very proud of the finished product. The buildings that I think were referenced at one point, Westminster and, and Congress, that really wouldn't have given you much of a steer, though, would it? You were trying to do something here that was completely different. Yeah, we, we, we were. We didn't want to be just another sort of classical column sort of facade or classic dome. Uh, but at the same time, um, we didn't want to succumb to sort of a, an excessively modernist sort of disposition to do something different for the sheer hell of it. There were, there were a lot of big, brutalist, concrete you know, designs around at the time, and, and the High Court, I suppose, manifests that particular architectural tradition. What we wanted was something that had a timeless elegance about it, that had some enough sort of classical references to other famous parliamentary-type buildings to be, to be recognisable as such, but somehow different. And I think the, uh, the winning design which is essentially a post-modernist design, which is a little bit eclectic in the way it drew upon earlier architectural traditions, nonetheless did so in a way that was just spectacularly elegant. It just stood out. It had a, it had a, you know, a visual clarity about it. It had a design elegance about it. You could see immediately the, the, the theory on which the building was constructed, the two wings of parliament, the executive and the public, but somehow all sort of integrated and, and flowing into each other. You know, the, the building had multiple addresses, but all of them you know, clear and distinguishable and all held together by a, sort of a, a beautiful harmony and beautiful coherence. The other thing we had to worry about was how it would look from the other side of the lake. I remember the group of us standing up the top of Mount Aisley and looking across and, um, and it had to somehow integrate with the old Parliament House. We, and we, we talked among ourselves, it couldn't just be sitting on top of the old Parliament House, looked at from across the lake like some kind of you know, flower hat at a, a garden party. It had to, it had to integrate um, somehow with it. And, and the, the design of the facade, the fenestration and the columns and so on, were actually designed to sort of to echo the, the rhythms of the windows, the fenestration and the old Parliament House. So there's a, an awful lot of attention to context, you know, to the total Canberra environment, the way it integrated with the avenues. And uh, to bring it all together in the way that it did, um, just as a design concept, was, I think, a fantastic achievement by uh, Aldo Jurgler and his team. There were a few cynics about it, even back in 1979. Was there, when you walked into that news conference to, to make the announcement, was there anything that bothered you? Was there something that you thought they might pick up on that would become a negative? No, I thought we, I thought we had it exactly right because um, you know, there's always an issue about cost and this sort of stuff. And, um, but again, I mean, David can no doubt comment on this. The, um, the, there was nothing about the engineering of the place which looked like it might be a Sydney Opera House you know, in the making, um, a grand concept that was just not going to be deliverable in realistic you know, time and, and budget. Um, no, and, and we just, I think we just knew we were on a winner. We knew that there was that clarity, that elegance, that um, you know, when, when, they br when we brought out the, uh, the building on a sort of a tray and it was put into, uh, by the, the handlers, into the, the hole in the donut of the Canberra terrain model that was there in the centre, I mean, there was just sort of gasps around. You were, you were probably there, remember it. Because it just immediately fitted. And I think we, we just knew it was, knew it was going to work. Yeah, that was my immediate impression, I have to say. David, you picked it up from there as director of uh, construction. Some 10,000 workers or some, at its peak. Just uh, describe the experience uh, from your point of view. Well, Barry, I think the first thing I'd recall is that uh, if the speaker felt as though he was overwhelmed when he came here when it was finished, I was 34 years old and uh, the project was four years in and uh, there was no end in sight. So um, uh, I was greatly overwhelmed, but I, I don't think I could have been as overwhelmed as Rick and Aldo were when they stood first at the top of Mount Ainsley and realised that they had to document this job. And so I think this has been a narrative about making this project. And I think it started right at the other end of the land axis of Canberra. And it's that narrative about making the building has almost been the consistent language of everybody who's been associated with it. Whether it was Aldo talking about the building, he always used the word making the building. He never really tried to sort of let the design ascend to a level that was beyond everybody. It was something we were all doing together. And, and, and whether it was Rick or Hal Guider or Pam Berg or Sir John Holland or, or Gordon Peaty, all of these people were seemed to 
pick up this consistent narrative about we are making the building. And I recall that the, uh, the, pro the project slo slogan is we are proudly building Australia's Parliament House. And that's what the workforce picked up on. And that became the unifying thing. And just looking around the room today, it's just fantastic to just see, I can see so many familiar pace, faces who, who joined in that collaboration to make this building. What was the experience like with, uh, with things like you know, industrial disputes, industrial accidents, <coughs> that kind of thing? Well, at the end of 84, the building was arguably two years behind schedule. Um, uh, whether that's right or wrong, I'm not sure, but um, it was still a uh, subject of considerable change by the parliament. There was lots of extensions and growth of the building. Um, so the architects were wrestling with that. Um, amongst that was some pretty turmoil uh, times with the uh, Builders Labourers Federation. And I have to say it was a Labour government that ultimately had to decide that uh, they were going to um, end that. And, um, and so it, it was that leadership that I think was a turning point where the BLF were, were uh, taken off the project and, and rightfully so. But it didn't end the industrial issues. Um, but look, I got very close to the CFMEU during the course of this job. And, and I can tell you that, uh, the, again, the narrative was that this building is going to be finished for the opening. And so um, I don't think the big issues were in the last four years about industrial. I think it was just the challenge of the logistics. I came down from where we lived up in uh, Red Hill during the course of the project and it just astounded me that every single day that State Circle had this ring of trucks around it, that by 11 o'clock the project had eaten up all of this content and those trucks went on their merry way to be back there the following morning. And I've never seen a, a project that, that just consumes stuff like this did. Yeah. And uh, we, we went from a turnover of, um, of about uh, $2.5 million a month when I first arrived. We averaged $25 million a month uh, throughout the whole period of the last four years. And we averaged just over $30 million a month in the last year. I could just tell you the appetite of this project to eat stuff <laughs> <laughs> just... <laughs> <coughs> seemed endless. <coughs> I'm sure, though, there were moments of frustration. I mean, which, with big projects like like this, politics being what it is, whoever's in opposition points up the cost overruns and the delays. It, it's a bit like the Sydney Olympics um, with the media as well. Uh, the most of the stories leading up to the Olympics, wherever they're held, are negative. And then when they finally happen, everybody celebrates. <laughs> did, did you ever feel that was the well, case? Well, again, at the, end, at the end of 84, we were in line for all those grenades, industrial um, time overruns, uh, budget costs, all of those things were in the light. What we decided when we sat down and said, well, what do we need to do to get this job finished, was we, <coughs> we developed a construction program that was different to the one that was here up until that point. The one that was here when I arrived seemed to be one that accommodated the slippages of the job as almost the culture. Mm. We, we drew a program uh, within three months where we said, no, we're going to have a retraction program that talks about finishing and going. And so we completely turned that around and we got everybody thinking about what was involved in achieving that. From that moment forward, and I know that, um, Rick, I, I caused the ire of some of your team, Pamil in particular, um, the first thing we said is that within three months, we're going to finish 100 square metres of this building. So find somewhere in this building that we can 100% finish in three months. And three months later, 1,000 square metres. And we made this the, the staging point to get through the 200,000 square metres that were before us. So that first 100 square metres, I guess, was token and, and stressful and uh, possibly we hung a bit of artwork, Rick, that we should never have hung in a building that was still leaking and uh, unair conditioned, but uh, we had to make a statement. The turning point, Barry, was when we started to have the open days where the, where the community started to realise what this building was all about. And I recall uh, my wife and everybody, uh, Robin's partners and, and, and Jack Kershaw's family, were, we were out there one Sunday and we'd done a barbecue for 3,000 people. It took us a week to scrub off the smell of sausages. <laughs> but, but from that moment forward, 
the whole attitude of this building and its perception in the community changed. People moved from the brick bats to suddenly absolutely being proud of it right the way through to the end. I don't think we've looked back from there. The Opera House had already been built. You're still in your 30s when this building is built. What, what do you do for an encore? <laughs> I spent the first years trying to cross it. The first ten years trying to cross it off my CV, because <laughs> you get a bit sick of being introduced that way. But um, right. <laughs> look, uh, these days the great thing is that uh, we're all in a position to put put a bit back. And I'm currently working at uh, as adjunct fellow at uh, at uh, Western Sydney University in the construction management program. So that's all about putting back. But look, you know, we've had a privileged. All of us have had a privilege to be part of this project. It's part of our personal story, and I think everybody who's here today a part of wanting to continue that all the way through. Well, Robin, you're well placed to talk about the, the artistic uh, merit of the building, but can you recall what your initial impressions were when you first saw the building? Um, I've always loved the building, and I think I just keep going back to um, what Pamela Berg's role was here. Uh, and I commend to you all, if you don't already have it, her book that she published uh, called Interwoven for the 25th anniversary in 2013. And that was quite specifically about the commissioning of Australian artists in this building. And I was just rereading this morning from the, from the book in the, uh, the bookstore that the commissioning of 85 individual Australian artists and the use of exclusively Australian materials was all about saying that art and craft needed to be an essential part of this building rather than just seen as a decoration. And that kind of echoes precisely my mantra about the role of art in our society. My quote is always, art is not the frill on the frock of life, but the very fabric of which it's woven. And I found that Pamela had really picked that up. So given the strength of the art that's in the very walls, in the furniture, the commissions, etc., and the ongoing collection, I think that I was deeply impressed. I was, uh, I was working with Pamela at the time. We, we were both serving on the Australia Council in the early 90s when I came here to my first artistic direction role as National Festival of Australian Theatre. And it was through Pam's eyes and to a certain extent Aldo's, I understood the value of art in this building. Um, it's both the collection, it's both the art and craft that's built inside it, um, but also the things that go on inside it. I think there is so much activity in terms of exhibitions and performances that maybe the general public outside Canberra and outside those lucky enough to come and have a visit as a school kid or something like that actually undervalue the value of the collection and the art that this place holds. And in a sense, what it bespeaks to me is the role of art in our society and therefore as part of our democracy. Now, it's not an art gallery, so... What is important in terms of placement, proximity? What is important so that you get maximum value out of the works? Uh, I think just coming to the place, I mean, a lot of the stuff you can see online, but essentially it's not a gallery, but there's so much built into it. If you really devoted time to looking at the workmanship and the craftsmanship that goes into the, the, the best of this building, then you would have a great experience of Australian art in the 20th century, the, the value of the craftsman, etc. But, you know, there have been some great, great moments here, apart from... Again, I think what the public mainly sees is question time and a whole lot of other things and they don't often see the, the richness of conversation that goes inside here and the richness of the collection and the art and artists. But I, well, exactly, we're, we're there's this amazing piece that's behind us, but it is literally everywhere. I do remember, however, in my very first encounters with this place, I was never lucky enough to come to Canberra as a school child. My first encounters were when I was directing the National Festival of Australian Theatre in the early 90s, and we hosted, I think maybe in 94, the Keatings, those fellowships for mid-career artists. And it was a wonderful moment, not only because it was the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra up on a stage here, playing Percy Granger, Australian composer's arrangement of the Londonderry air, that is Danny Boy. It's a magnificent piece of music and that was the introit for Keating to walk down the centre. And it was, it, it, was, it was not just the music, not just a Tasmania, a great Tasmanian orchestra playing, but it was in this place. And all through the centenary of Canberra, we kept saying we want to increase pride in the national capital, but at the same time saying, 
saying you can't force people to be proud. They have to feel it. And I think that it's undoubtedly people come here and as opposed to the often the public image of the tenor of politics or what goes on in question time, I think when people come into the building, I think people understand it and feel proud. And mm. a part of that, I think, is the artistic input that went into it. Mm. Kay, just a bit of context um, uh, in, in your situation, you became very close to being having the distinction of being the last senator appointed in the old building, and then Bob McMullen came in between the '87 election and, and the opening of the building. That's right. And just denied you that that privilege. Just. <laughs> so you have a, a recollection of the old building and the facilities and the way it was in those last few years. Tell us about that. Well, I came in 1987 and being the last person to be elected after a five-week five wait, it felt like a five-year wait for the count, I got the last room in Parliament House in the Senate, which was not much bigger than a broom cupboard. And it was so small that my printer had to be under the stairs behind my office. So if we wanted to get a piece of printing, we'd have to run out, unlock the door behind the, under the stairs and get, get it out. There was a tradition that as people moved on, you went up to a better room, but I didn't get that chance because Bob came up here. I, think, I don't know if he even started down in the house, but we came up and we went through that whole process. He got the second last room and I got, uh, he got the last room and I got the second last room up here when everyone else had chosen their rooms. I actually thought it was a ridiculous idea to keep changing, so I stayed in that room for about 12 or 13 years yeah. till I went to the blue carpet area. But I just want to add something what Robin said. When we first came up here, the gardens were very bare and small trees. And as I spent 21 years here, the, tree, the, the gardens grew. And I think we forget the role that the gardeners play because often when things are going really badly, to walk out into those gardens at, at different seasons, at the moment they're all um, autumn colours, but in spring they're beautiful spring flowers. It is a moment of being able to just catch your breath and, and I used to always try and walk from the chamber to my, back to my office through the gardens because they are absolutely superb. And I think people just forget how, much, how important they are for members and senators. They're very important for me. So I think that's another form of art, really. And they've grown into these magnificent gardens now. And I think it's a very special... And we get to see part of it that the public don't always see. For example, the Prime Minister's um, entrance in spring is just blooming with wisteria in this beautiful, beautiful, almost Japanese garden. And there are little pockets of different scenes. So I think that's another form of art, Robin, that often gets forgotten, but it, is, it was a very big difference from the old Parliament House. So what else struck you about the um, um, transitioning from one to the other? I mean, obviously the old building was a, a rabbit warren. There wasn't a lot of room for anybody. Um, in fact, I think that probably what caused people to, to go to common spaces because their own offices were so tight. This is probably my rationale for the popularity of the old non-members bar. Uh, but people just needed to get out of their offices at times and find common spaces. Well, the offices were very tiny. I remember having people in constituents in, and I only had three chairs. And if there were five or six of them, they had to keep rotating if the meeting was a bit too long, especially if they're older people. And uh, so people did go out to get away from their staff, but for them to get away from the minute their, their senators and members. But the, the bar was often used, and people weren't always drinking, but they were there interacting. I think that was a loss when we came up here because I think people came from different parties and met in that way. When we came up here, because we had our own offices and you could have guests that you couldn't have in your own office in Old Parliament House, people didn't use the bar as much. In fact, I think it's had about three iterations. I think I remember having flu vaccines in it at one stage. It, it, it worked as a sort of little surgery for about three days while we all got vaccinated. But I think that changed some of that interaction that doesn't happen anymore in Old Palmer House. I think the other thing was that we didn't have our own bathrooms and toilets. Uh, and you didn't get the chance to bump into a minister, although I have to say that the women, the few women in the parliament didn't have many ministers they could bump into, but the men, I, I presume, <laughs> bumped into each other in the toilet. And so there was that, not that, just meeting people in common spaces and chatting and catching people walking across King's Hall. And I think that was diluted when we came up here. Mm. Yeah, I remember Mick Young saying that it must be the only parliamentary building in the world where 
you go to the toilet and you're going to be berated by a drunk journalist <laughs> while you're there. Just a trivial question. The Bogong moths, I don't recall them being a problem in the old parliament. Did they just arrive here because suddenly you had the lights on the hill? I don't know why they arrived. I think it's because they, the, the building was very well lit the first year we were here. I think it was the first year. They were hanging off the windows like big bunches of grapes, in fact taking up maybe half of the window. Not only that, they got into every nook and cranny in our offices behind books, in cups and saucers, um, and into the light fittings. And there was the smell of barbecued bogong moths for the whole of <laughs> the spring. And I think they've decreased because I think they've, they've turned the lights down at night. I think, I, I'm not an expert in that, and maybe somebody else who's more au fait with it, but it was, a plague the first year. Yeah. Now, Michelle, um, looking back on the transition, in uh, w did you leave the old building with a heavy heart or were you looking forward to the facilities in this building? I think many of us did leave the old building with a heavy heart. Uh, by the stage uh, that we were leaving, the building was bursting out all over. Uh, it um, had had a, a temporary wing added for the uh, uh, politicians because there was a, a desire not to uh, um, leave too early. And um, as for the, the gallery, it was incredibly crowded. Our office, the Age Office, was on the Senate side of the gallery in the winter. It was absolutely freezing because you had to uh, run across the, the roof to the press boxes. And of course, remember, this was pre-email days, so everything came uh, into the press boxes in hard copy, and there'd be a bell, and uh, off people would go to get the latest press release. Um, I remember also in the summer, uh, going across that, um, that ramp to the boxes and uh, one day John Button, who liked to do a bit of sunbathing in the uh, roof section um, in the gallery area, somehow got himself locked out and someone had to um, unlock the, the relevant uh, bit of the, the roof and um, liberate him. Uh, fortunately, I, I think it wasn't a, a time when there was a division on. But um, in general, it was a very crowded uh, spaces for the media as uh, for the politicians. But of course, the advantage of that was that there was more intimacy in the building. And I think that that benefited the media. Uh, but also, I think that the move to this uh, more spacious quarters for everyone has matched, has in a way been a metaphor for the changes in uh, politics uh, in, in society and in relationships between the media and uh, the politicians. And everything has got bigger. The building facilitated that. Uh, and everything has really got a bit more distant. Now, I think that would have happened anyway. Uh, it's a separate phenomenon from that of, of changing buildings, but it's a sort of it's part of it, it's a parallel phenomenon. There's less uh, trust now between politicians and uh, journalists, and there were many reasons for that. So we got uh, better facilities, uh, but there was a cost in that. However, we should put that in the context that uh, we as federal reporters are really very privileged to be in broadly the same space as those we're covering. This is a contrast to, say, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, to uh, Washington, and that, that really gives us an incredible degree of access, even if some of that intimacy has gone. The intimacy might, might have gone, but of course, because of the mobile phone, for, for example. Most journalists now have the, the mobile numbers of all of the politicians. They, you, there are different ways now of achieving the access. Um, in many senses, I think um, your access to the politicians is greater than it was in the old building. It's just that you don't have that opportunity to meet them physically. 
Well, I'd say, Barry, that there's access and access. I think it's more structured these days. You've got a whole uh, class of um, professional minders which over the years has expanded. Of course, uh, there were minders in 60s, 70s, even going back further, but now there's an army of them and it's a particularly well-trained army and I don't say that in a complimentary sense because they are uh, trained to sort of um, limit and, and corral the access. And if you want a really big contrast, think back not to our time in the old building, but think back to the 1940s in the old building. John Curtin's time, where he would have the journalists, and there were only a handful of them, down to his office. It's wartime, twice a day, giving briefings of great detail about the war progress, much of it not to be reported in the short term uh, or to be passed up to, to their employers. But uh, that was, I think, the time of uh, maximum and most dramatic intimacy in the, in the old building. Yeah, it's numbers too that, that made it more difficult. It's not just the, the, the nature of the building. And this, this building allowed the numbers to expand and of yeah. course the role of television. Going back to uh, say the curtain time in the old building, there was the ABC and, um, and nothing else in terms of electronic media and, and that, was, that was radio. But television increasingly over the decades came to uh, shape the the nature of politics and campaigns and I think that 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 is a big change now that was of course happening separately to the uh, transfer from one building to another but it it was uh, expanding in parallel yeah. Gareth do you think the privacy became important to politicians once they moved from the old building to the new well it certainly to some extent relished in the opportunity to be able to creep away and occupy your own space and not be exposed to that endless intermingling which was so characteristic of the, the ten years that I spent in the down there before the ten years I spent up here. Yeah, I mean it's that ability to get away from it in this sort of rough and tumble environment is important and the ability to escape from it is, uh, is important. But I mean you do lose something uh, in the process. I mean there was a lot more in the old building uh, intermingling uh, between executive and backbenchers. There's a lot more intermingling between, as has been said, uh, parliamentarians directly physically in the press. There's a lot more intermingling across party lines, basically, because you were, you know, you're in each other's pockets all day long, and uh, you just couldn't avoid that. Well, I mean. Yeah, but it was it, it was okay. And, and there was a, there was what what I liked, I suppose, most about the uh, about the old building was a glorious laxity in security. Yes. <laughs> glorious laxity. I mean, um, I remember you know the late seventies after a portrait was put up in King's Hall of Sir John Kerr, um, Peter Walsh's staff, I think we can now disclose the the villain, put a sticker, a red nose sticker on the on the, on the portrait, and uh, nobody was in any rush either to remove the sticker or to um, <laughs> find and punish the, the perpetrator. I think, um, I think that very same staffer was the one that actually wore around her, her neck uh, for about five or six years in the parliament uh, on the, the photo ID, a picture of a, you know, a rather glamorous red setter uh, rather than, and, and with absolutely nobody taking any notice you know, whatsoever. So, um, if we're thinking of the same staffer, I can go through a whole list of atrocities. <laughs> but yeah. but um, for, for the first 10 years up here, the security was not all that intrusive. Yes, the yeah. security the doors and so on, but I think what we have actually lost very recently in this obsession with security for everything is, is some of the things that did make this place so attractive, not least the access to the, the grass ramps over the top and all that stuff is now closed in and walled off, which is, which is a great pity. Okay. Well, I think one of the other things is unlike almost any other work situation, it's not just all day you were with your staff down in the old house, it was till three and four in the morning as well and that's why you really needed when we got up here to have that relief of being able to get away for at least a few minutes, most pre made such a difference. And the hours now are a little bit more sensible than they used to be. I mean, it was inhumane uh, and it was very, very close. As Gareth was say saying, if you got out to get away from the staff and to let them get away from you, 
you inevitably met people because it was crowded. Mm -hmm. So, and it was crowded day and night. And so I think it was an environment that wasn't very healthy in lots of ways. I think people now can, have a, can rest, they can take some space away. So I think, although there are some differences, I think there's some great benefits of the building. So, I, you know, what you lose on the merry-go-round, you make up on the... Well, the motions, motions used to get very raw, of course, as they do in a parliamentary environment, including within the party. I remember some glorious actual physical punch-ups that took place in the, the members' bar, you know, late at night. Yeah. You know, things got completely out of hand and uh, yeah. <laughs> extraordinary sort of environment. And, and nobody likes increased security, but... The, you had the incident where the four-wheel drive was driven through the front door. The, the, the ACTU rally got out of control. You've had people jump out of the public galleries onto the floor of the parliament. I mean, at some stage, based also on overseas experiences, you've got to step it up a bit. You can't, uh, you can't have that kind of thing going on. Um, David, if you were to start a project of this size today, what would be different? Well, Barry, uh, I guess the perspective I'd bring to, the answer, to that question is that I'm speaking on behalf of the makers of the built world. And, you know, we're looking to the future of all of the things that are changing dramatically in our industry. So whether it's architecture or engineering, building, manufacture, assembly. I reflected on that question um, on the way down here today and, and I... I look back and I, my gut feel would be that we made about 80% of this building on the site. If we were to make that building today, I believe we would only make 60% of the building on, on the site. And if we were to make this building in 2030, my estimate is that we'll only make about 50% of the building. So the first thing you would imagine today if you were to pick up the ball on this is that between now and 2030, the, the shift that is happening in the way buildings are made all around the world is changing and so are the skills and the relationships between the professions and the supply chain. I just made a brief list of the things, Barry, that, that were made in Australia that are in this building today that would not be in, made in Australia today. They include the windows, the doors, the clocks, the locks, the toots, the taps, the pipes, the pumps, the sensors, the wires, the furniture, the carpets, the ceramic ties, tiles, the paint, and all the cranes, and possibly the flag mast. Mm. Why is that? What, what has changed? Is it now so much cheaper to bring everything by containers? Uh, yeah, look, I think that uh, what's happened in that period of time, uh, I've just finished reading a book, The Box That Changed the World, and it's about sea containers. And the general view is that the cost of uh, all goods anywhere in the world today, the cost of transporting anything in the world, reflected in the final retail price, is about only 1%. So it doesn't matter where you move stuff across the world, reflected in the final cost is about 1%. So what that's saying to you, that there's no place to hide if you're uh, unproductive and expensive. The cost of on-site construction in Australia today is about $100 an hour. Um, Off-site in Australia, it's about $50 an hour. And offshore, it's probably only $20 an hour. I mean, that's the answer. What about the skills? The skills that existed through the 80s, do they still exist today? Well, the wonderful skills we assembled here, um, for example, the Stucco Lustra in, in, the, in the hall next door. Um, we were blessed with the fact that we had some Irish plasterers who, who knew that skill and came here and shared it. And I. And I saw Aldo at one stage with a trowel showing the strokes that he would like to see. Now, I'm sure that we could still do those things. But by and large, in this transformation of what's going on, is that as more stuff goes on off-site, the residual skill sets on-site are going to be assembly. So this room's a really good example, because all of these panels in this room were made off-site. It was only a matter of two or three weeks. We went from blocks to all of this joinery. So I, I think we're seeing such a transformation of an industry going on um, that the skills on site are going to be those that are more about putting prefabricated stuff in from off site as opposed to the stucco lustra in the hall next door. And off site, the skills are very different because in a manufacturing process, the skills become very narrow. You don't need to be a fully-fledged carpenter. 
to be in a production line making a timber cupboard. So we're seeing quite a big shift in that. And, I, and if I was to pick up on what Michelle was saying is that I, I'm concerned that the, that the people that surround, that the politicians surround themselves with these days tend to dumb down the thinking that is needed to think about where are we going to be in a global built world context in 10 years from now. And, and to be very harsh about it, when I talk to people away from Canberra, um, having been down here several times to talk to people and saying, do we have a, a position as to where we'd like to be in the built world industry in the world in 10 years from now? And remember that the world will turn over about 15 trillion US dollars of construction by 2025 and Australia will only turn over about 350 billion. So we represent about 2 to 3 per cent of the global construction uh, canvas. So we need to have a much more strategic view. And you come down here and you have to find your way through a, an advisor and you go back to Sydney and everyone says, well, what did you work, come away with? I said, well, you can tell them from, they're from Canberra because you can tell them nothing. <laughs> Robin? It's, it seems to me that that's a, a very, very pertinent reflection on how we value things. Because if the bottom line is the only valuation, where do we say, it, yes, yes, it's not going to meet a bottom line, but how do we put Australian craftsmanship um, on show? How do we continue to be proud of it? And, it's, and it's, a, it's a constant thing that we in the arts come up against about the other ways that one must value things right. rather than just their, just their cost. And I come back to that, certainly it was alive during 2013, the business of a, a new lodge for the Prime Minister as an arch Australian architectural show place where you could show it off, where it could be a wonderful glorification of the great architectural and building skills we have. But nobody, no Prime Minister will ever set that in motion because of the outcry there would be at its cost and its waste and so it seems to me that we are in some sort of conflict about yeah. what, what, are, what are the inherent values of things rather than simply the cost. Can I just add to that, I mean there's got to be a real determination at the political leadership level to maintain the integrity of this building because there's constantly going to be pressures either to put cram new people in to change the nature of existing spaces and even with some of the artefacts and I mean when John Howard put, you know, British-made Chesterfield sofas into the Prime Minister's office and threw out the contemporary wonderful, you know, furniture that had been very much part of the design concept of Aldo and Rick and the rest of them from the beginning. I mean, that was saying something about a, a, just a lack of commitment to what makes this place incredibly distinctive. And I think it's incumbent tremendously on all of us who care passionately about this place to maintain the, the pressure on the decision makers, both bureaucratic and political, to do nothing that will undermine the fundamental clarity of the original vision of this place and the wonderful showcasing that it gave to um, the whole generation of Australian artisans and artists. Yeah. It has held up well though, hasn't it, David? Yeah. So look, I think um, Barry, the building, I mean, I, I'm a constant reader about the building and uh, it doesn't reflect any of the calamities that some of the buildings that uh, were made at the time. I mean, there were some buildings that were, that were really rushed together for the bicentenary and some of them were, were pretty ordinary when we went and had a look at it. I think every one of us here can uh, take a great deal of pride that um, uh, people like Richard Roberts, who, who, who led the Quality Assurance Group here, uh, that was his life's work and what went into this building had to be right and I think the dividend of that is that the building has really got great bones and it's stood up well and it's been able to accommodate then the art narrative that has been installed in it. And I'll ask you about your, your memories but uh, I would have thought in 30 short years this place has built up an extraordinary amount of, of, of memories, uh, notable visits but Michelle the, some of the big debates already that have gone on just recently, the same-sex marriage debate, but before that, the apologies to the stolen generations, the big native title debates, there have been some really big moments. Well, that's right, and I, I guess uh, the only qualification I'd put on that is that uh, whatever building the, the Parliament's been housed in uh, in more than a century of federation, uh, there have been huge moments right through, but you're right that there have been very great moments uh, in this building. I guess the the biggest moment in in uh, federal political history, in a way, took place in the old one, though, and that was 
the the aftermath of the the dismissal and and those days which mm. were incredibly dramatic for for those there can i make a qu quite separate point barry i think one of the interesting uh, features of this building is that it's um, imported uh, a separate political industry into it and that is the lobbying industry now again the lobbying industry has grown in in parallel uh, with the developments we're talking about of the transition from one parliament house to the other but uh, the lobbyists do literally live in this building uh, quite a bit of the time when parliament's in session and they even though the it's very hard to uh, get into the more private parts of the building these days the lobbyists do have uh, passes and they set up shop over there in aussies when parliament's sitting and they can they literally set up shop they'll take over tables and they'll work there from early in the morning till um, uh, quite late in the afternoon and they have uh, an access to the politicians that uh, is is really quite remarkable so I, I do think when we're talking about the professionalization of politics which I think is the is a thing that's characterized politics uh, in our generation the lo the role of the lobbyists for better or worse shouldn't be forgotten sorry I took yeah. you completely off your question what, what, what do you say to that Gareth about the yeah, well, I find, like most of us do, all this stuff is pretty tacky. And, um, you know, it is unfortunate, I think, that... Um, tacky but effective. Mm? Tacky, tacky but, but effective. Yeah, I know, but um, <laughs> they really were a creepy bunch to deal with, most of these characters. <laughs> um, <clears throat> luckily, I was foreign minister for the last eight years and I could escape their clutches and be out of the country most of the time. But, um, no, I mean, that's, that's one kind of access which I don't think has contributed much to the quality of our democracy, I'm afraid. Okay. I, I'd, take, I'd take issue with, with um, Michelle. That's a pretty game thing to do. <laughs> but um, well, Tory. I actually think that um, when a lobbyist comes com really with passion about an issue, and then a week later they turn up with somebody else about which another topic totally different about equally passionate, I actually didn't find them very convincing at all. And I like to see the people actually delivering a service or doing something rather than coming with a lobbyist. And I thought it was, counter, well, for me, it was counterproductive. So I would take issue that everyone uses and, and believes what, and in some ways, some people I felt were prostituting themselves in the sense that they seemed to sort of, whatever issue they were being paid for, they were passionate about. I wanted to see the people who were delivering something being passionate about it. I guess my point is that uh, a building of, of this magnitude Allows that. Uh, does facilitate uh, a, um, can I call them a sunrise industry? <laughs> um, and David, of course, the, the fence that, uh, that, that had to go up as a result of um, security arrangements, and it's, it's still a work in progress. It just seems to me, though, on, on my observation today, having not been here for a while, it's, it's not going to be quite as imposing as I kind of imagined when, when I first heard that it was happening. Yes, I have to say, Barry, I thought it was a little bit more resolved than I expected it to be as well. Um, I still think that it's, a, it's an unfortunate um, state for us to have arrived at, but, you know, we shouldn't be surprised. The Prime Minister's suite is located inside the building, and that was a direct relationship between the Ananda Marga bombing back at that stage and the building was, for a security reason, the PM suite moved back in and unfortunately that could have been accommodated within the original design thinking. But, you know, it's, it, I, I think it's going to look fine and um, now I know the next debate's going to be where can we expand to and there's views as to whether, whether you can do that around the edges of the building. Look, I think if we leave it in the right hands, but we do need to have a plan that goes for 20 years. We can't just be ad hoc because as Robin was saying about this building is that in woven into this building is its narrative. And if it simply becomes an ad hoc variation of that narrative, we're going to lose the, I guess, the, the delight and the support of the Australian population. I mean, I know many people don't have the ability to walk all the way down this axis 
through this building and all the way into uh, the cabinet room. But you know, when you start and look at the bank's marquetry that's in the foyer, and people stand there and go, wow. And then you follow that all the way down. And if you get into the cabinet room and you see that wonderful bow that's sitting up over the table, and if someone has got the time to explain to you, and can you see the blowfly and the dragonfly carved up in that? I mean, to me, they were the considered parts of the story. Mm. So I would really be distressed, Barry, if we, if we don't get a plan for this building that, that is not going to start to become an ad hoc story. Yeah. It was also a considered part of the story to be able to walk over and kids to be able to roll down that grassy slope and so on. And I have to say, I lament the passing of that. Why the hell it couldn't have been enough just to stretch bollards across the front to stop trucks and whatever, you know, driving up and just a little bit more of a security presence permanently at the top of the hill? Why not? We've just really lost something. Well, it's an ad, it's an ad hoc response. So. Well, my, my great disappointment in the centenary of, uh, of uh, Canberra was I had a great plot that we could drive sheep, farmers could drive sheep onto all the roads into Canberra and then the sheep would be let out on the grass. Yeah. They, could, they could eat the grass and the money we saved from that could all go into the arts budget. But <laughs> they wouldn't let the sheep on the grass. What can I say? <laughs> well, I, I recently um, had some homeless horses and it said on Twitter, you know, can anyone uh, suggest a solution? And a number of very cynical replies came, take them to Parliament House, they've got plenty of room there. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a few minutes uh, for questions, so we, we will take, um, take some questions uh, just in a moment. Um, Robin, you, you, you mentioned the centenary of um, Canberra, and, and you worked on a production, didn't you, at the time about Yeah, we did. I, I decided that I would approach uh, the Australian Ballet to see if they would do a, um, a new work about Parliament House. So that, uh, David gladly agreed to that. We got a choreographer, Gary Stewart of the Australian Dance Theatre and desi designer, Mary Moore, and again, Pamil Berg facilitated the conversation between these two creatives and Aldo. And that right. was, I mean, that was an enormous privilege that he took us through the building. He was so eloquent and generous generous in his, his conversation with these artists and they constructed a really fantastic piece. We just learned from Aldo again that narrative that went through the whole the, the whole building and, and uh, you were there at the time and what they came up with was a, a great piece of work. Mary got his designs and put them onto a thing that we could project against the theatre and, and I think this is right, isn't it, that when the building was designed it was sort of pre the use of CAD. So yes. it, was, it was paper more or less and at the end of the uh, Aldo and his daughter, hi you are here today, came to the production and at the end of the premiere um, I said to Aldo kind of tenaciously, well Aldo, what did you think? And he actually, I swear, said to me, the greatest moment of my life, I saw the building move. Mm. And he yeah. meant that he saw the dancers move, but he actually saw his designs, his plan, move on screen, which he hadn't seen before. Mm. So it again to me, that bespeaks of the the depth and the wealth that this building has to inspire future generations of artists and projects. There's just so much in here that you can dig into. It's not just the building, but it's everything that goes about it as well and everything that was initially built into it. Well, look at the tapestries up on the galleries here. I mean, fantastic. If there has to be any expansion, that we don't lose the, the view, sometimes standing just in front of the War Memorial on the edge of the lake, that view of, of new Parliament House with its arms around old Parliament House. And if you didn't know they looked like one building, I think it's still one of the most beautiful views in Australia yeah. and, and also from Mount Ainsley. So if anybody reads what we've said when they're looking at what they're gonna do, I hope that they don't in, in any way disturb that beautiful uh, scene because it, it's breathtaking. I think um, the speaker said the beat when he first came, when you see the building, it takes your breath away, and it does take your breath away. And I still drive up to Parliament House and think, oh, my God, fathers, I worked there. You know, it still catches you. Also, the other thing that catches you is that um, they fly the half flag at half-mast when I think a minister dies, and that's very salutary too because Jocelyn Newman recently, her funeral, and as you drive past and see the flag at half-mast, it's a constant reminder 
that not everyone has, that it may fly for you one day. So it's a very symbolic building for many of us who've, who've lived and worked here. Was that your experience, Gareth, when you were foreign minister with visiting dignitaries? Were, were they impressed with what they saw? Yeah, they, they were knocked out, basically. And in particular, if we could ever do that grand pr progression that David talked about when the doors there opened up and they came through the doors before and you went through the central hall and then into the cabinet room for, for a meeting there. You know, the sort of the integratedness, the fluency of the building and the overwhelming character of it, it just was, was a knockout, actually. It was a huge okay. asset for us. All right, we've got, uh, got some questions. There's one over here. Oh, there's several. We've got a microphone going around. Thank you. Thank you, panel. That was very interesting. I uh, have a question about the flagpole, two different aspects of it. Um, was it ever the intention of Aldo Jurgula that the triangle actually uh, creates the same symmetry as um, Marion... Griffin's original um, pyramidal building that she did, had sort of vaguely penciled in on her lovely paint, uh, paintings. That was one question. The other one is, uh, have we never considered putting in Beijing Olympic style fans for the flag so that we can have it flying all the time? <laughs> Very hard to pick that up, what was it? Did you get the first question, David, on the... I wouldn't profess to be uh, someone who can explain to you all of the thought that, uh, that was into the design. Um, I mean, I just recall making the flag mast and, and, and the fact that uh, we could only put it together at um, between about midnight and four in the morning because the moment the sun hit one side of it, it, it got longer on the eastern side and started to lean to the west. So I'm told that by the engineers that that's not a good idea to weld up a building that's got that stress in it. <laughs> so, um, so I can tell you that at minus 10 up there at, um, at midnight, um, it, it was a pretty tough sort of thing. But, uh, but look, you know, everywhere you go in this building and see where the flag reflects itself, whether it's in the reflection pool here behind us, which is very special to see that flag just sitting even stationary. Mike, when we saw it stretched out in the basement one day, it's the size of a double-decker bus. I mean, it really is. It really is huge. Uh, if you ride the funicular up to the top and actually have the privilege of actually being up there and seeing what it's like, that's another special feeling. But I'll never, ever forget the gasp of the workforce and the people that were here the day that um, Senator McClellan, Doug McClellan, was in fact officiated that day and, and called for the unfolding of the flag. And it just just unfolded as, and as if there was a, a, a magic breath. It just floated out straight away. And you know, I think it's an amazing, amazing thing. And then one of the sad things, of course, is that some architects who don't have much talent then started to stick these little faux replicas on buildings all over Australia. And I thought that was offensive. <laughs> <laughs> And as for whether we get industrial blowers to keep the flag blowing the whole time, it might, <laughs> the speaker might have to take that one on notice, I think. <laughs> um, Robin? Yeah, as, as to your question, I'm not sure whether, um, Aldo, and I don't know whether um, others could, could answer the question more, but certainly speaking to Aldo, he had thought that he had looked very carefully at the Griffin plan. So I would be very surprised if that hadn't become a consideration. And he took us very proudly up to the balcony and showed us the preserved Griffin line through there. And it was one of the reasons that David Heaton, the historian on our team, worked so hard to get that memorial plaque to Marion, the first major plaque, which is now up on Mount Ainsley, so that when you're up there, you can see that fantastic vista. But um, due honour is also given to her as well as the lake named for Walter. Can I, can I just add on the jury for the design competition, we were acutely conscious of the Griffin plan and the Marion Marnie you know, rendering of that, which had on the hill with the, the capital, it, it wasn't a properly thought through concept, but it was always intended to be a focal point. And we were looking in the winning design for something that captured the spirit and maintained the integrity of the, uh, the Griffin plan. An incredible number of the original 329 competition entries were just remarkably indifferent to mm -hmm. the reality of this plan and the, the, you know, the, this, this location as, as central to it. And we, we almost immediately just dismissed them as, as just not getting it, not understanding that this had to work. 
and maintain the real integrity of the, the Griffin design, which, which it, it does in abundance. Next question. In the middle. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting discussion. I wanted to follow up the comments on the greater interaction in the old Parliament House. Uh, we've heard about backbenchers lobbying ministers in the bathrooms. Uh, we've heard about the, the non-members bar. One of the physical features of the new house that hasn't been commented on to a great extent is the separate executive wing and the remoteness of the executive wing, which I think all will agree has led to much less interaction between ordinary members and executive ministers. My question is, to what extent do, did those involved in the design and the construction appreciate the implications of that physical separation, the political implications? Was that on, on your mind when you were judging it, Harry? Yeah, I mean, in, in the judging of it, um, it was part of the design brief right from the beginning, which was generated by the, the parliament itself and the parliamentary officers, that there be a separate executive wing. So we didn't really have any choice in the matter. And I think we, we all knew from the outset that this would be a downside of the, of the design, that you would lose you know, some of that um, interaction uh, for all the advantages that go with it. But there, w there wasn't really much choice in terms of the utilitarian you know, calculus that had to be made about how everything came together and fitted together within this huge sprawling sort of complex. So I think it was, it was just a given you know, from the beginning and there's not a lot we could, we could do about it. The hope was that there'd be enough other interaction spaces you know, with the, the members' dining rooms and the members' bars as well as the non-members that you know, somehow it would work anyway. Well, it hasn't really. I mean, the, the executive has been very much fenced off, I think, um, you know, from the wider parliament, which is, I have to say, from the executive's point of view, a consummation devoutly to be wished most of the time, but that's uh, not a view from the, you know, our parliamentary colleagues backbenchers colleagues. Uh, and yeah. Was that the experience too, Kay, that at, at first you thought there might be lots of interaction, there, there was yeah. an ability to do that, but then you just went back to the various groupings? I think having the space in your office meant that you could have people in your office, so you didn't actually go into those common areas as, as frequently. Mm. I also think it's a factor for the staff. I did say to my staff when we went to the ministerial wing, if you develop blue carpet syndrome, just remember, as quickly as we got here, we'll depart even more quickly. And I think some of the young staffers do see themselves as a bit of cut above, and they also don't interact as much with the other staff because they see each other and they don't see some of the other staff. So I think if I had to say any criticism of the design, I would have preferred to have seen the executive wing not there and, and people distributed throughout, because I do think it, it changes the dynamics, even at the staff level. Next. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, good day. thanks very much for the very positive speakers. Uh, it's nice to hear so much positivity. Sorry to turn to the negative side, but um, I wonder what the, the speakers think about uh, what is happening over four areas in the building, which I'll just outline briefly. At the beginning of this session, um, Mr. Stefanik um, mentioned that the Queen said that parliamentary democracy was easily destroyed. I would suggest that the integrity of this building, which uh, Gareth Evans has spoken of several times, is also very easily destroyed, certainly at the secondary level. The bones of the building are magnificent. The materials of the building are magnificent. The fixed artworks like this mighty thing in front of us are magnificent. But what about the secondary things that are also significant? And I'll just mention four of them. The graphics and the signage of this building, which is the creation one of the great signage and graphics of people, Emery Vincent in Melbourne, has now become as just a, a melange of uh, different fonts and different colours, all competing with one another as you go from one part of the building to another. Just have a look, uh, if you don't know what the original ones are. The, the original font is not even used in the publicity for the building anymore. 
That's the first one. <clears throat> the second one is um, indoor plants or pot plants. We now have tropical pot plants, whereas the idea was that they would connect with the, the foliage in the gardens and in the larger landscape beyond. Now they stand as sort of irrelevant. They don't connect anymore. The lighting inside and outside the building is atrocious. I think of it as a third world railway station. You know, it's sort of so badly lit. And, um, you know, that could all be reconsidered. It was, it was to make it cheaper, you know, and an accountant and a, an engineer were sent on a world trip in the 1990s and came back with uh, ways to change all the light bulbs so that, you know, nothing looked as it did anymore. And the, th the last one, perhaps the most important one, is the conceptual basis of the art program, which is one of Pamil Berg's uh, documents. It's been abandoned as far as the movable uh, artworks are concerned. There's sort of no context, no meaning. Um, they're practically absent in the public areas of the building apart from the fixed ones, or they're there under some other separate sort of agenda. Yes. Um, each of these four things, and I will stop on this, um, has a document that goes with it, either produced by the by the um, the architects, in the case of the pot plants, in the case of the um, uh, the uh, the um, the art program. Um, but, but as far as the fonts are concerned, there is the wonderful large-scale manual from Emery Vincent, which I presume is still somewhere and hasn't been dumped yet. And the lighting uh, was designed by one of the great lighting designers of the world. I'm sorry, I don't know the name anymore. And there's the document from, from them. Okay, so you, we can so very uh, easily lose these secondary yeah, things. You've raised quite a few issues there, so we'd uh, better leave ourselves time to deal with them. But Robin, perhaps your best place to deal with some of those. And from your experience, for a visitor walking into this building, um, does it have a sense of access or do people tend to just go to King's Hall, make their way to Question Time and, and then leave again? Well, I think that's fantastic that you, you raise those points. I'm not, I'm not uh, aware of the process whereby, and I don't even know what the current art plan is, but if it's a radical departure than the, the, from what was first intended in all those areas, in font and in plants and all those things, then I would say it challenges precisely what Gareth was talking about, and that is, and what you were talking about, the integrity of the building. Um, and I guess that's something that a building everywhere is subject to. I mean, we know very well the tragedy of the Sydney Opera House was when the integrity of that building was very early compromised. We know that Griffin's departure from Canberra was actually about challenging the integrity of the overall plan. Um, we know that these things go wrong all the time. Alas, I'm not, uh, I'm not enough in the know to understand when or how those things have been abandoned or neglected, but I would suggest that it's a very good idea that someone somewhere goes back to those original writings and those original very, very thorough plans and, as you've said, you know, continuing that narrative and seeing what needs to be done, I guess, yeah, as you mentioned with the lighting, if it's a matter of, well, first of all, possibly environmental and maybe there needed to be a solution around that, but uh, to, it, it'll be, again, a cost factor, won't it? It'll be about what we really want to afford and, again, that question of are we willing to pay the money, are politicians able to approve the spending of the money that the large electorate may not approve of, etc. So it's a, it's, it's sort of you're talking about secondary measures, but actually it's quite a big question about how we value, how we go back, and how we preserve the integrity of any building, including all the bits and pieces. Because as I say again, all the bits and pieces were never considered as bits and pieces; they were integral to the holistic nature of this building, which w was certainly originally and for the most part absolutely fantastic. The presiding officers are really at the focal point of the custodianship of this building and, and I just think that it's fantastic and it speaks a lot to our country that you can stand up today as there would be many, many other people who would have views about this building and share those thoughts with us and I just hope that, well you're recorded to start with so that's a great step, <laughs> that's not going to get airbrushed out. Um, so I just hope that what you had to say is noted 
And the people who have the custodianship of this building hear that because there's thousands of people like you who share your views. So well, you, well done you for expressing them. Thank you. And I'll just say on the, on the question of light too, some of the, the natural light that goes into the chambers, photographers over the years have managed to exploit that to sometimes to the detriment of the politicians, but you get some uh, remarkable images uh, with, with the light in the chambers. Um, this will have to be the last question. Who's got the microphone? Somebody has to choose. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now the pressure's on. <laughs> um, I've got a, a couple of comments about um, the discussion points that you've raised, and they kind of tie together. Um, I am a designer and have grown up in Canberra as a third generation Canberran and have been very proud to see this building be built and to grow into what it is today. I really agree with your comments about the um, integration of art within the building and I think that as this is our national capital icon of the whole of Australia, it's so important that we have that value of art within what we do. I'm also very interested in your points about could we do this today? The skills which have taken place to build this building used multiple people's crafts. In today's society, we're doing more and more of the compartmentalising. One person designs a cabinet, another person makes it, another person flat packs it, another person puts it together at home. How are we in this, you know, in this important moment of our 30th anniversary of this building, how are we ensuring that we have those skills as we move forward into the next 30 years and beyond? Thank you. And David, that's kind of picking up on a point that you made a little earlier. Uh, I, I think your comments echo our, co our conversation and the questions that you've made. I mean, since this building was built, this is really the last hand-drawn public building. And since then, um, CAD and BIM Technologies have taken the craft of drawing a building so that you can then make a building. That's all changed. And I'm finding that there's a lot of people out there who can use the technology, but if you put a pencil in their hands, they, act, they turn white in front of you. So I think there's a, a challenge for the design profession. But if, if, if we just close the conversation out simply by a memory that will always be in my mind, the limitations of drawing this building was in two dimensions, and, and at times it challenged the makers. And I remember up in the parliamentary library, there are some curved shapes in the ceilings there where the curved walls join other parts of the building to achieve a certain design. And it was simply impossible, really, to put that in a two-dimensional expression. And I recall getting a call from the site uh, project manager there saying, the guys are all up here trying to work out how to do this. So lo and behold, Hal Guider leaves the design drawing board down at at uh, Monica, comes up here, and there are, there are pictures of this with Hal sitting on the floor with the plasterers sketching what he had in mind and them all saying, oh, now we get it, and that's they went and made it. Mm. And I think, you know, if we, that's the challenge we've got is that we can, we can lose this tactile speciality of making the built world and just turn it into a sterile place. We can't do that. But you know, we, the designers and the makers have got to somehow continue that bond that I just saw ex expressed day in, day out. But that example of Hal Guider sitting on that concrete floor up in the library mm -hmm. and they then put a, uh, a, a small safety fence around the sketches on the floor which he did in chalk and they used that as the reference to actually complete the plaster work. It was, yeah. it was just an amazing experience. Well, that's a lovely anecdote to end the discussion with. Thank you, everybody, for your interest and for coming along, and please thank the panel. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, as somebody who's only been associated with this building for about 200, two and a half years, not 200 years, <laughs> 
I maintain my youthful looks. Uh, I found this uh, discussion today educational and, uh, and very thought-provoking. Um, I'll just quickly pick up on a few points, and, and I'd certainly um, noted some of the anxieties expressed in some of the, um, in some of the comments made. Um, I was glad to hear the, the mention of the gardens. Um, they are magnificent, uh, and in autumn they always are. Um, if you haven't had a chance to walk through them, I'd invite you um, to do that. Um, also, if you'd like to take a close look at the lawns with uh, our landscape people have mown the 30 uh, into the lawns, it's um, quite magnificent to see. Um, and Professor Evans, I can uh, assure you that there's still 100 metres of grass ramp to roll down, um, and I invite you to join me after this if you are. Uh... <laughs> um, uh, in terms of the art collection, um, I, I noted the gentleman's comments about the signage, lighting, uh, plants. Um, there are projects to improve and reinstate the design integrity on many of those things. Um, there are things over the years that have, um, that have occurred. Um, there's a strategic approach to, to dealing with those. Um, I also want to give you an assurance that the permanent collection is intact and we in fact are uh, adding to it uh, each year. Um, important to mention that we are working closely with Pamil Berg uh, on everything we do at the moment. Uh, Pamil um, and Hal Guider are moral rights administrators on behalf of um, uh, Aldo Jurgula. Um, so please rest assured uh, that that consultation occurs uh, quite often and quite frequently. In fact, Pamil was in the building the last two days uh, meeting with our people uh, on design intent um, related projects. Um, thank you, Robin, also for mentioning Interwoven, um, a naked, shameless plug. Um, there are copies of the Interwoven book in the Parliament shop uh, for anybody that's interested. Um, we also have 15% off as a birthday special. <laughs> um, noting that there are other questions, um, we will attempt to answer them on our website. Um, so please keep an eye out uh, for it and we will um, try to address anything that, that weren't, uh, wasn't able to be answered today. Um, again, I would like to um, thank Barry uh, and the panellists uh, for their insights today. We'll be continuing the 30th anniversary celebrations this afternoon with a special performance by an ensemble from the Cam Canberra Symphony Orchestra. Uh, here in the Great Hall from 2pm, uh, the orchestra will play music from some of Australia's most celebrated composers um, and a new composition will be played which will be a world premiere. The doors to the Great Hall will reopen at 1.45. Uh, I look forward to seeing many of you back here then uh, for what I think will be a moving performance. Uh, for our special guests who are joining us for lunch in the Members' Hall, uh, please, make your, make, <coughs> excuse me, please make your way uh, through the Members' Hall um, through the doors at the back. And um, at this point, uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, hopefully, hopefully I'll see you a little bit later.